We're going to talk about Java. And I think, although Java is like ancient, probably, if you compare it to Kotlin, Java is still awesome. I mean, Java is a language that is well known, well used. There are a lot of best practices on it. And, but if you like it or not, you can say from Java it's perhaps a bit conservative if you compare it to other new languages. But you know, most of us are Java programmers and we do this every day and if we need something, there's a lot of things we can look up at Stack Overflow. <laughs> Try that with Kotlin. <laughs> but if we look at Java, we say it is conservative. Just Java had some um, upgrades the last couple of years and some upgrades were more important than others, of course. If you look at the sliding over here, we see the updates of the last few generations of Java. And I mean, Java 5 was important, we know. Still, there's things in Java 5 we use every day. Say, generics, um, enhanced for loops, auto and unboxing, type safe enums, all that kind of stuff we still use every day if you're a Java programmer. So, Java 5 can, can, can be considered as one of the major updates in Java. What, 20 to 2004? 2006, Java 6 came out. Do you know what the major upgrades in Java 6 were? New input output. Sorry? New, new input output. As well, but I think the major things were JDBC 4.0, JAXWS 2.0, and some security things. But if you compare it to Java 5, not that important for us as coders, as developers, not new fancy stuff we can use. Java 7. Do you remember what that brought us? Diamond, diamond operator, yeah. of course. Diamond operator, private resources, string statements. But my most and my most favorite thing in Java 7 was this one. Oh. Yeah, we can use underscores and liter literal integers, literal numbers. And again, it was not that important. But if you see Java 8, Java 8 promised us things. Promised us shiny new features we could use to develop new things. Java 9 just came out, and actually if you look at Java 9 from a coder perspective, it's not that important. I mean, the modularity thing is important, but it's over here, and we are working up here. I mean, if you don't have, if you're, if you're not into developing libraries for the community, and you're just coding your application, Java 9 didn't bring us fancy new things. Java 8 did. It's but what? It supports domain-driven design, so it's really, uh, really helpful to. Of course, it's really, it's really helpful. But if you see, you're all you give for most of us. Our all-day work is in the enterprise, and do you need to care a lot of with with, with, with that kind of stuff? Not that much. <coughs> if you compare it to Java 8. So we got to talk about Java 8 because Java 8 was, of course, it will do a bit of Java 9, of course, but Java 8 came out in March 2014. <coughs> so we're approximately three years from that. Almost four. Um, it promised us new things. Some new shiny features that should change our way of coding. I mean, things like higher order functions and we should think more functional. Well, I hope all of you use Java 8, right? Who's still on Java 7? 6, 5, 4, Awesome. So, Java 8 is the thing we work on in production. Are, are there people working on Java 9 right now? Working with Java 9. So, Java 8 is something that is important to us because we work with it every day. But let's see what it brought us. What promises did it did came true? What are the good, bad, and ugly things of Java 8? But first, before doing that, normally you start with it, but I will come in halfway. My name is Brian. I'm a consultant. As a software engineer, so I'm an engineer. I work with Java every day. I work as well with Kotlin, so no big. But I work for a company called Blue for IT, consultancy company. We work for major companies uh, all over the Netherlands. One of my colleagues actually works here at Balticom. And um, yeah, that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. This is considered some sort of a best practice doc. And the best practice is a commercial or professional procedure that is accepted or prescribed as being correct or most effective. It's just an opinion. I mean, there are some edge cases or some cases that in your particular case, you should do it differently. Of course, it can be true. 
everything I say is well stuffed and well researched, but please make up your own opinion because some things are just personal flavors. So why Java 8? These were the promises. We could parallelize, parallelize more. That was the main selling point of Java 8. It would give you less boilerplate code with things like lambdas, so fewer lines of code. Well, that's obvious because, I mean, I'm lazy. If I could do more things with fewer lines of code, I like it. And if you take the rules of software engineering, if you have fewer lines of code, fewer possibilities, a bug, mistakes. Um, it would give us new solutions to problems we had, for optional, for example. And the main point was it would make our code more readable with the functional perspective that Java 8 should bring us. Well, let's dive into first thing, lambdas. Lambdas was one of the new major things. Well, what is a lambda? I hope you all use lambdas or not. Who doesn't use lambdas? More. Awesome. A lambda is an anonymous inner function. Please keep these three words in mind, anonymous in inner function. So actually, just a nameless function without boilerplate code. But then you can say, what is a function? What do we know as a function? Normally, you probably would say that a function is equal to something like a method. But it's actually true. Because we live in an object-oriented world. And in an object-oriented world, we live with methods, not with functions. Methods are part of a class. Actually, you could say that a method is a subroutine of a class. It lives inside of a class. Although we can use statics, we still need to define a class to make a method. So what is a function? A function in Java is something that satisfies the functional interface, which basically is nothing more than we have to implement one abstract method. Okay. Well, if you see a lambda over, uh, you see a lambda on the downside of the of the slide. On the left-hand side, you see parameters, you see an arrow, and you see a function body. And please pronounce this thing as a lambda, not a lambda or a lada. A lada is a very old car made in Eastern Europe, I guess. But I heard so much, much pronunciations, I'm like, okay, well. But if you look at lambdas and functional interfaces, there are four new four functional interfaces. Perhaps it's all basic for you, for, for you, but I will get through this very quickly. We have four new functional, main new functional interface, because they're actually very, very much more. Predicates, um, functions, a predicate simply gives us something if it's true or false. A function takes something, gives you something back. A consumer, which takes something and gives you nothing back, and normally I said it's, it's equal to my wife. <laughs> and a supplier, which takes nothing and gives you everything. Well, these are some implementations of it predicate if something is, is even or not. The consumer, it takes something and it gives in this way, it gives you a side effect, but it gives you nothing back. The supplier gives you something out of thin air. And the function takes something, in this case an integer, and gives you back a string. Well, of course we have more, say by functions, which can take two things and combine them together. That's all very neat, but what can I do with it? Or actually, we already had this, right? Because in Java 7, we had these kind of things with comparators, callables, and runnables. Still, things with one abstract method. And now in Java 8, we can write them as well as a lambda. Because in Java 7, if we had to use a comparator, we had to write all this bullcrap. I mean, collection.sort, I had to overwrite the compare method. I, yeah. Because the only important part is this. So why not reuse it? I use this because you use it in the collection the sort method, but because we can use uh, functions on interfaces, function implementation interface, we can also use it on the list itself. We only need to work with the things that matter. All the boilerplate code, besides it, we can leave it behind. That's the uh, true power of the lambda. That's all very nice, but in the same way, we can use these kind of abstractions 
in our own methods. So normally, if we have a function that is like for 80% the same, and we need to make a new function that, is the, that, that does 20% something different, but 80% the same as the other functions, normally people would tend to copy and paste it. Just alter the lines of code, and you know that copy and pasting bugs happen. Things go horribly wrong normally. Or we have to change everything in four, five, six methods, and there's no continuity with it, with it anymore. But now we can do the same with our, with our new function. I made this function do foo, and for the lower and upper case, in this case, I just provide a lambda that does the tricky part of it. And all my super interesting code, which is on the top side and the downside of, in this case, my very important print line, can just be in one function. So the abstraction, we can now give functionality. We can now um, give uh, meaning to functions. We can give functions to functions. We can make higher order functions. We can write lambdas in two ways, but you already know that, right? We have the, we have the single line lambda, now we have the multi-line lambda. Well, we have a third part, of course, and that is the method preference. Well, there's a lot of debate about the method preferences. If it's the way to go or not. <coughs> well, it looks quite slim, but if you're starting a functional program and you do not have any background with it, I would say stay with the first part. Why? It's easier to have the same cadence over here. You have, you have the input, arrow, output. And now because we have an input that can be applied directly to a function, we can make a function, or we can maybe make a method reference. Some say it's more readable, like Judge Block, and say, for instance, Heinz Kibbutz would say this is more readable, and you should do this. On the other hand, if you have Stephen Colborn, which is the inventor of Yoda time, he said, I don't like it. I, I, don't, I don't really like it, so I use the, the, the upper part. The problem, as well, is if you have to change your lambda, because you have to do more than just give it to a, uh, give it to a method reference, Oh, you get you, get, you give it to veterans. You cannot do this anymore. All right, you all you all use use lambdas and that kind of stuff, right? You're working with Java eight, so I have a little bit bit of a puzzle for you guys. I'm a bear lover, so I just do my examples with bears. I have three bears on my list, and every bear contains a name and an alpha percentage, and I want to sort this. And I make maybe a sort function. I did it in line one and line two. Take a close look. Which line is good? The, if we look at answer A, line one comparison, like the, line two doesn't, of compiles, and line two doesn't. Answer B, line two compiles, and line one doesn't. Answer C, both lines, lines will compile. And answer D, I don't really care, just give me one. You'll take a look. You all took a look at it. Who thinks answer A is correct? Who thinks answer B is correct? Who think answer C is correct? And who think answer D is correct? Good answer. The guys who just <laughs> held their hand up for answer B, you're my man. Answer A is correct. Why? Because of this. The first line is a single line lambda. And a single line lambda has an implicit return. The second line, okay, it's a bit tricky, but I use the, the, the parentheses over there, the, the curly brackets. And if you use a curly bracket, you actually specify a function body. And when you use a function body, you have to explicitly give a return statement. That comes to the conclusion that I would actually say Block lambdas. We can do more than just one thing in a block lambda. In this case, I just print line and I have to give the return statement over there and return a value because in this case it's a function. But why should you? I mean, a lambda was an anonymous inner function. That means you can give it to a higher order function. And if you have block lambdas, it's not that nice. I mean, 
your whole code will screw up. So it would actually say don't do block lambdas. It is possible, but it makes lambdas... Makes debugging much more fun. Sorry? It makes debugging much more fun. <laughs> Well, I'll, 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 I, I can meet you tomorrow and you can debug about the code my colleagues made with, with block line handlers. <laughs> I hate it. I mean, why should you? Normally, we have separations of concerns, and I would say that if you have more than one line in a lambda, you should separate it, in this case, in a method and give it a useful name, more useful than my method, and use that in your lambda because it describes behavior. And if you give that behavior a good name, and naming is the most important part in every kind of language, and the most difficult part, I would say. If you give it a good name, you can still use it in a single line lambda, which makes it far more readable than a block lambda. If you don't, have, who doesn't agree with me? Thank you. So again, don't do block lambdas because this one is quite simply to read, right? But I saw kind of kinds of things like this. I have a bear as an input, and I will just describe a complete function with if else statement try catches or even worse. You still like debugging block line lambda? Block lambda? <coughs> Go ahead. But it's, it's a real code from the. Okay. No, it's not real code. Oh. It's bogus code. <laughs> but actually, I did see people writing lambdas like this, and I say I hate lambdas. Yeah, if you write them like this, I can understand you hate lambdas because they are, they are designed to use as anonymous inner functions. Don't do this. Just don't do this. If you do this, just abstract it into a separate method and call it. Normally you would do that, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't, like, you wouldn't write your whole program in just the main function. It's like actually the same, same kind of logistic. Okay, other things you should not do with lambdas. We have type inferencing. That's cool. So you do not need to say that the type of B1 and B2 in this case are beers because the compiler already knows it. And the compiler is far, far, far more faster and far better than you ever be, I guess, in, unless you are working on a Java compiler. And these things are just written and lambdas are designed to have less volume of code. So please do not add it if you're compiler or your IDE is not complaining about type. Same holds with parentheses. If we have only one incoming parameter, please don't use the parentheses in it. Because I give it as an inner function. And we have more parentheses and more parentheses and more parentheses and it's even it's getting more and more readable. Now. So there was, there were, these were the basics. And you guys all work with lambdas and Java and that kind of stuff. So we're going to the elephant in the room. Exceptions. <laughs> How can I throw checked exceptions from inside Java 8 stream for lambdas? You don't. You cannot. Who agrees with these guys? You cannot. <laughs> well, unless it's a no pointer. If no point, you cannot catch a no pointer. But no, you, you're completely right. The simple answer is it's not possible. You cannot, at least not directly. But I said you don't. You it's don't. Not, you don't. You it's not good to do it. It's not good to do, but sometimes you have to use functions that throw exceptions. <coughs> you and you can say, if, okay, I would do that in an imperative style, but I actually want to do this in a <coughs> more functional style, but I hate it because it's throwing exceptions. And I will come with, this, with a solution. It's not perfect. It's some sneaky throwing. No, but you, you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll be mixing two programming styles. Yep, so true. Good. You're, you're mixing two programming styles. On the other hand, um, which other language, not on a JVM, it has um, a, a, a check exceptions? I don't know any. Java has checked exceptions. I hate checked exceptions. Check, check exceptions is pure idiot. <coughs> checked exception, in my opinion, is pure. But again, opinions, right? First slide, the disclaimer, opinions. Checked ex exceptions are evil. Why? Most of the times, the exception is thrown and you should already th thought of it on format. If something doesn't exist in my code, it's actually the end of the world because there's a config file not there or there's an input file not there and nothing will happen. Okay, it throws an exception. Duh. 
But normally I would check that on forehand, and you should. That means good design. But if you, sometimes you need to use libraries that have checked exceptions. So what do you do there? You can say, do it imperative style. But say you want to do it in a lambda. Say we have this. I want to do something that throws an is empty exception on my beer. And is empty on a beer is like hell. If my beer is empty, no. And you have to check it because I don't. I hate empty exceptions. So how do we do this? Because I declared a function over here. You shouldn't do this actually. Declaring a function over here because you use it in line. But just for the sake of argument. This is not possible. Now, you can do this. We use our block lambda again, and we do a try catch, and now I can use that function in my, in my stream or whatever. But it's not very pretty, right? If you should do this, and you, sh you want to catch that exception and, and do something with it, you can wrap it into something that does it for you same that we, as we did, did with a normal block lambda. And this will run. There's no problem. This will, this will actually work. But we just discussed that checked exceptions are pure evil. How many of you guys just, if you have an exception, wrap it into a runtime and rethrow it? I think 9 out of 10 times, I do it. Because normally I will check on forehand if something exists or does happen. And if the exception, if I need to try catch an exception, just wrap it into a runtime and we'll see what happens. Because it normally, in my case, it will be end of the world. If we know this, we can make our own utility file. Say we have our own functional interface over here. And I just make my new, my, 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 my special functional interface, which throws a throwable. It's just a copy of a normal function, uh, functional interface for function. And I, I name it check function. And then I will make a utility file, and I will put this function in it, which simply is a wrapper. OK, this is a block wrapper. But I will put it away nicely down beneath, down below in my utility file. Nobody ever touched it anymore. Yep, and you can, still, you can still get it out and put it in a separate function. Of course you can. But now I just can use the wrap around my Lambda, and I can still use it as a readable Lambda with, a check, with, with an exception that is checked. If you have to do it, I would suggest to do something like this. Just make a utility file. Wrap it into a runtime, never care about it anymore. But again, opinions. Another thing, because Lambdas are the basics, let's go to optionals. Something completely different, or is it? An optional, what is an optional? An optional, if we look at it, is in some way the maybe monad implementation of Java. Now people get scared because of the M word. Don't get scared. A monad is nothing more than an encapsulation um, of a group of types to make sure that some behavior can or cannot happen. So encapsul just, just an encapsulation. Just consider it as a wrapper with some extra function. A monad is not that scary. So it's a new type in Java 8. And you can consider it a wrapper around a value, around a value that may be absent. That's what that monad wants to grasp. It's designed to tackle the null reference problem. And of course, there are different opinions. Some think that, that, it's, that it's a very nice way to handle this problem. And some say it's utterly ugly. Because there are some problems with options. Well. Normally, you would use an optional like this. We have an optional, and it can be empty, or it can have a literal something. Nothing more, nothing happened. But you would say there is only, there are only two options. But there you are wrong, because we live in an object-oriented world. Optional can be no. Exactly. And there are still some people that First, assign an option of or any variable valuable to null, and then fill it with something else. Please do not, because if an optional is null and you try to look into it, you still have a null pointer exception. So if you avoid, you they should make this illegal. If you make this illegal or not possible, or your compiler would 
even cry and scream and throw things at you if you do this, then optional, would, in my opinion, would be a good thing. But there are some things more with optional, and I will show you some code. Uh, all right, let's go into Coco. So we have optionals over here, right? I just made a very small, small kind of code. And in this case, we have an optional. And what most people tend to do is, okay, I want to have the value of the optional, so I can say, okay, maybe user dot get, which give me will give me the, the, the name. But the problem is, and they should make this illegal as well. This work. This will work fine if I if I print this out. Say I will do this, and I will point it over here. No problem, right? But if I do this, we'll have a problem. For those who don't believe me, there's no such thing because the option was empty. Well, what many people tend to do is, okay, um, well, and I say, I hear some, some, some people say, oh, that, that's, that's, that's a great reaction. Oh, again. Yes, 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 let's combine functional programming style or whatever you call it and just combine it with imperative style. Not good, because optional is in the functional part of Java and not in the imperative style of Java. So what should you do? If, Say, sorry? If present or met. Yes. Correct, 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 correct. In this case, we want to we want to give it the, to to say a string name. Well, I can say maybe user. And if I don't want, don't want to do anything with it, or else. I can just say or else. Or else get method. I will come to that. I will come. Sorry. You're, you're too fast, man. You're too fast. Sorry. <laughs> Probably this will work. I mean, we just want the, the, the inside of, of my maybe user, or else I will just get a string unknown. Hello, please do something. And then yeah. I have to prohibit the name unknown to get a special value. I know, but just for the sake of argument, just just to keep it with the with the with optionals, you can do the or else if you want to do something else with it. You can use a map function on it, and this will actually say, okay, I want to have the name. I have a name, and I want to uh, say, well, uppercase. Sorry? Uppercase. Okay, doesn't matter. Perfect. Well, it can happen, but the problem with this is, hey, why is, uh, oh, my name is, of course, uh, I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> but always give your uh, parameters inside your lambda, give it useful names. Don't use I, X, B, C, or something, because if you have more than that, nobody... Also look what people do. Not what oh, yeah, look, yeah, exactly, exactly. But, and of course, if you use this kind of programming, please do it on the next line because it will be more readable. Well, this work per works perfectly, right? Now, yeah, it's still unknown, of course. But if I would, would use the other function, hey, wow, cool. So in this case, you can use the, uh, your optional more in a functional kind of way. But somebody already spoiled my next trick. There is there is something wrong with this, or not something wrong. Say I have a new private function that gives me back a string as well, and I call it if not present. 
and I will, just for the sake of argument again, I will say, not here. And I will return it an empty string in this case. Don't know why I would do that. And I say on the other hand, well, that's perfect. Or just say do that as well, private string is here, and it will, will give me a string. And I simply return my input. Say, I have the, uh, my name thing over here, and uh, I would say uh, it's here, and I will give it my uh, my name thingy. And I, and in this case, I will say, uh, what was the name of it? If not here, if not if not present. Perfect. The thing I want to uh, know is that name would have the value of ball.com. Okay. It has. But the strange thing is, is that both print lines, so the is here and the not here, are both present in my output. So that means that both the map and the or else part are evaluated. Although my output is what it needs to be, this isn't. So we need to take care of that, or else that even if or else is not useful, it, it still gets evaluated. So if you use or else, you must be sure that there are no way, there are no side effects. But in some cases, you want to say, okay, if it's not there, let's create a new user in the database. That's a valid thing to do. If my user is not there, I want to create a new value in the database and I want to return his name. Don't use the or else statement because in this case, the map, perfect, works. And then the or else will be kicked off as well. The, re the, the, the return value of the name would be, would be something that we expect, but I think it's counterintuitive that the or else part is evaluated as well. Keep that in mind because a lot of people make mistakes with that. Because, well, if I read it like that, it would make sense, right? What we can do is make or else get, and or else get needs a supplier. So in this case, I will simply turn my function into a supplier. And now, see what happens. I will see my or else part is not evaluated. So if you just do or else to assign something to a variable, it's no problem. But if you do side effects with it, and we need to do side effects, we cannot be side effect free. In this case, the side effect was printing, but you can do side effects like creating a user in a database or deleting something or whatever. Please make sure to use or else get and write proper testing. But that's because again mixed into styles and very different function. Yeah, but we are using Java. If you want to use pure functional things, just use Haskell or something. We have to work with libraries. The, these things are, uh, are are written in an imperative uh, uh, well, in maybe perspective. Maybe you more well, than needed. Maybe, 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 but the, the point is not, not mixing them up. It's actually making your code more readable or not. That's the way, that, that, that is declarative style of programming. And you can argue if this is functional or not. I mean, if it's, is it really functional? We do not have the actual monad thing. Is, can we talk about functional in that case? We can clarify, I think we can call it more imperative, bigger scope. And yeah, in an imperative style, we have to deal with some things. We have to deal with statefulness. We have to deal with things like side effects. Normally, you would raise it in a functional language. You would raise it into a monad and do it over there. So outside of the monad, you, you would not have any problem with it. But actually, in Java, it's just sugarcoating, and 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 down below, it's still imperative. I, I would say just still use it because it's more readable than if else and then get. But again, that's an opinion. But make sure that you know what you do, and that's the most important part. Know what you're actually so doing. So you're hiding side effects. It would be better to, to have them explicit. Exactly. Now, from the practical point of view, it's really useful. The or else get is really useful, and it was the well-known 
issue of guava option. Yeah, mm. yeah. I would actually say make or else uh, 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 deprecate. Make or else deprecate because you you would expect that it will be not evaluated. If you have an if else statement, else will not be evaluated if the if you you uh, if the if statement is fulfilled, right? In this case, it is. It, it, it's counterintuitive. So you have to take care of that. Now, and I, I agree with you, you're mixing two paradigms. But that's reality. But making reality better and making reality worse too? I mean, why I'm, just point, I'm just pointing out in this case that or else is always evaluated and or else get isn't. Just have to take care of it. If you want to use it in your way, be my guest. I'm not, I'm not here to, to, pray, to, to, to play God and say you have to do this and not this. But you have to take care of that, or else is counterintuitively than what you would probably expect. Of course, you can also use th things like, or else throw, throw, and you can throw an exception, and you can throw an exception at the supplier again. Say, I want to do a. And if it's not there, it will, it will, it will throw an exception. And in this case, in the force F throw, yeah. the, the method reference uh, looks better. I agree. I agree. But looks looking something look, looking better or not is still opinionized. For so, me. For you. <laughs> I, I agree. I completely agree with you. But if you are uh, working with people that tend to work for 30 years on imperative style of programming, and now they work with lambdas, and they say, OK, let me give it a try. It's better to have just one way to write a lambda, mm -hmm. let it get used to it, and then IntelliJ has all the options like make it a method reference. But first you have to get used to it to make it better, <coughs> to make it make better, better looking, or else they will say, what was this again? Yeah, it's strange, why just don't do one thing? It's easier to, to grasp the concept by doing one thing, and after that, but if something well, looks looking better- Maybe depends on the level of your engineers. Sorry? Maybe it depends on the level of your true. engineers. True. Some can jump two steps at a time and some can not. Some can, some cannot. But I would recommend for people who are learning functional programming, or learning uh, in imperative style of programming, or lambdas, first stick with one pattern, and after that, I would agree in most parts, uh, method references would be more clear and would be less boilerplate again. All right, on the other hand, we have something if we do not want to give it over here, we just want to do something with the maybe. We can use the dot if present, and if present does stay in consumer, and the consumer in this case is uh, system out. Again, exactly the per perfect consumer, right? <laughs> in this case, I will use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need consumer. Yeah, don't use X. I know. But it, will, it, it, it works. If it's present, it will print it. If it's not present, it will not. But then if it's not present, then I want to do, want to do something else. Then we have a bit of a problem in Java 8. But in Java 9, there's kind of a solution with it. Because in Java 9, we have if, if present or else. It will take a consumer and a runnable. So. In this case, I make this a runnable. It does do nothing. And I will just. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I press it. Perfect. So if it's present, it will print out. And if, it, if it's not present, it will just. Uh, it should be wrong. It should be wrong, I know. But I give it a. In this case, but now you can steer again on uh, functions that does not give, do not give any feedback. So with your, oh, it's not quite visible over here. So with the if present or else, we have the option to do something or do something else if it's not present, which is quite a nice feature in, in Java 9. The only problem I have with this is, okay, if it's present, I want to throw an exception. Because, say for instance, create new user. 
I will look the user up, it gives me back an optional, because my function gives me back an optional. And if it's present, I want to, want to throw an exception. You could say not throw an exception, of course. Yeah, then we have a problem. But I think the most nice, the nicest way is if present, we do not have something if present throw. Use block lambda. And in that case, throw an, throw an exception. So you can do like things like this. It looks like higher level needs to be refactored in this case. Yes, <laughs> it like is, it is. But if no. you do want to do it in one line, this is the only option. Because I would suggest to make something like if present throw. If you have, now because you have or else throw, why would not the other way around? If you have or else throw, you should have, you should have it done the other way. My opinion. But okay, that's all about optionals for now. Let's turn back to slides. Uh, switch was this. Perfect. So, uh, oh, don't use necessary optionals. I really have seen this. Yes, we have something, we throw it into an optional and we ask the optional if it's present. Wow, just use this now, far more readable. Use optional in a more functional way, we already did this. So optionals, you can have three options, be aware, be, be aware it can be null. Never assign it in, in, in your code to null. And please, uh, um, just choose something to do with optionals. You can use it everywhere. You can use it only when publicly available. When, when, when you make it publicly available, don't use it at all. It's an option. I would say do the middle one. Do it when it's publicly available. You force your audience that uses your function to look into the optional and to prevent stupidity on their side. That's my opinion again. But make a decision with your team or with your colleagues and stick to that. You cannot use it everywhere. You shouldn't use it as a field because it's not synchronized. True. But there are people that, that, that try to use it everywhere. I wouldn't use it in, say, POJOs and make things optional. Well, make it null and make sure that your return, that, that your getters, perhaps, return an optional if you want to use it that way. But be careful. Just don't apply it, but think about it. Streams. Streams are not a data structure. I cannot say that enough. It's not data, it's not storage. Please do not use it that way. It's a flow of data that is derived <laughs> from a collection. Just so it's something in between. And that's because of the nature of that the, that the data is lazy. That means that if you're working in a stream and in the meantime, your collection is changed, you have a bit of a problem. Be aware of that. A stream is used as an intermediate result. You can transform data, but it cannot mutate data. So you cannot set the, uh, the, 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 uh, the object you have. You cannot set anything on it. You can create a new object with it. Because we cannot transform something. We cannot, uh, we cannot mutate something. The awesome part of streams is we can create pipelines and make things more readable. We have two types. If you have a stream, we have two types of function. Intermediate functions, which return a stream, and we have terminal functions. Terminal functions actually kick off the stream and do something with it. If you do not use a terminal function, nothing will happen, just like little children. Please bring the garbage out. Bring the garbage out. Please bring the garbage Bring the garbage out, and you, you will not get any new video games, OK? That's what streams. Streams are lazy. Just do something when it needs to be done. Normally, you would do something like this in a, say, Java 7 or previous style. We need to, we need to get uh, the beers and we need to want to have the good beers, so more than 7.5% of alcohol. You would, something, you would do something like this. In a more stream kind of way, we can use other things. Filter, which returns me a stream. Is lazy. Does, doesn't do anything until it's kicked off. Map. We want to transform it, or we want to transform the stream. We, we take the name of the beer, and after that, we want to collect it, which is a terminal function, and we we want to wrap it together into a list, 
how we turn it. First things first. If you use this, don't do and don't do to try don't try to do anything in one filter. People tend to okay turn this, this, that, that. It's perfectly safe and perfectly to do so to use filter and filter on the first thing. Again, not filter and filter on the second thing, which in my opinion makes it more readable. If you first of all you shouldn't do block lambdas of course, but if you compare these filters into one gigantic filter and put it into a method, I don't think it gets more readable. It's perfectly fine to do filter, map, again filter, again map, but make sure you do it in the correct order. But perfectly fine to keep them separate. Um, so actually filter, map are higher order functions because they can consume or they can take a lambda, do something with the stream, and provide you with something. <laughs> in this case, we explain what instead of how to do it. This is how. It's like going, going to your bartender and say, I don't want a mojito, no. <coughs> you put three leaves of mint, then you put a bit of rum, then you put the ice on it, and you crush it, and no. You say, I want a mojito. Same this way. I don't want to go all to this. I just want to filter on this, I want to map on it, and then I want to have the list. For each, people th tend to think like, okay, we have a list, I can, uh, I can provide our each on it. And then I can have an ugly, ugly, ugly kind of block lambda with an if statement. No. Please do not use the for each method. And people tend to use the for each like se uh, several times in one method. Like, okay, beers, for each do this. Okay, and then again, beers, for each do that. And what you do with for each is it's a terminal function. So every time for each is called, the whole list is being uh, 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 traversed. And then again, you do, beer, you do again a beer for each, and the whole list is traversed again. And again, and again. The other things like filter and map are lazy. So you can chain them together make it a readable IKEA kind of step plan, and I collect it. For each, can be used to provide side effects. But, like in this case, we set something. I would actually tend to say don't use setters. Make your uh, objects, in this case, immutable. And in this case, I had a new function, say new beer with ratings, that provides me a new beer with the same data in it and the application of my ratings I want to add to the beer and actually returns me a new object. And you can say, yeah, probably you have too many objects in your system, but if that is really the case, perhaps you should work on other parts. Because I think with immutability, it keeps it much simpler because you do not have to keep in mind what the state of an object is. The object is the object, final. And then you can reason about it even more. Because else you would say, okay, if I take this leaf of my, my program or this leaf, it would end up, I don't know anymore. But that's for a whole lot of talk. Just to keep you awake. I, um, I, had, to plan, I had to plan a mission uh, yesterday. And I had uh, four teams. This, these are my normal teams. Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Bill. I put them in the stream, and then um, Team Bravo called. Sorry, one of my guys is sick, and we need. We have a four-man group, so with three guys, I cannot. I, can, I cannot work uh, work my, uh, my my objectives. So I said, no problem. I have Team Echo uh, stand by, and I will put them in. What would be my answer in this case? Just take a look at it. Okay, who says A? Who says B? Do you use this in interviews? Hmm? Do you use this in interviews? No. No fucking quiet. Who oh, yes. <laughs> who, th who thinks C? Few. Who thinks D? The answer is C. Because we do not do anything to the uh, concurrency of the of this of the of the uh, of the list. 
we actually only say in this case, I want a stream. Okay, no problem. But I do not do anything with streams. And streams are lazy. So I can, and a stream is not a data structure, right? A stream is derived from data structure. So I simply add or remove and add something to my list, and then I kick off the stream. From that purpose, it, the stream is going to work for me. Before that, it doesn't work, it doesn't do anything. That said, you should not return a stream from a function. People tend to use, okay, stream, lazy, nice, return it. But we have another problem with streams because we can only use a stream once. If you use a stream twice, we get an exception because it's not a data structure, it's something derived from a data structure. It's already used and just create a new stream and do that. But if you use it twice, we get a legal state exception. So please do not return a stream from your functions. Why? We, if you get a stream from a, from a function you call, you do not know if the stream is already traversed or not. So you have to assume that it's traversed. And what can you do with that? Well, you can write a collector, perhaps. If that is necessary, if that, if that is very handy, I would say do not return a stream, return the actual list. It's nice, right? <coughs> what does it do? Just like my kids, nothing. Because peak is a nasty one. Peak is an intermediate function that can contain a side effect. <coughs> Boom. It doesn't do anything. Because it's an intermediate function which returns a stream. I still do not do anything because the stream doesn't have the urge to do something. I do not, ha do not have it for each on the end. I do not have a collector on the end or reduce or whatever. It doesn't do anything. But if you look at this piece of code, it's okay, right? Oh, oh we we'll probably will end up in this case with, uh, I, know, I, know, I know the list, the list where the word appears I had before. Oh, we end up with, uh, with, a, with a runtime exception. Nope, doesn't do anything. What I said before, right? Multiple filters and multiple, multiple maps, just use them. These are more readable than chaining these two together in the same filter. I think this is quite obvious. Infinite streams, oh, this is a nice one. Infinite streams, infinite streams are awesome because we have streams in this case, we can make them infinite. And just have my correct demo. Infinite streams. Well, I have an in stream over here. Can you read it? Perfect. And we'll, uh, if I run this, it will run forever and ever and ever and ever. Or not. Because I have an exception here. Other thing. No. Perfect. Let's run it again. You see, it will run forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And ever. Well, nothing special. But okay. put a limer in it. Will this work? Well, the output looks fine, but you see, it's still running. It's still running. <laughs> oh, it's just one thread, right? So no problem, I have a multi-core multi system. But it's still running. Why I limited it, right? Yeah, kinda. <laughs> kinda. Got now, now, now it's finished. Because my iterator only returns me because of my lambda over here only returns me zeros at once. So the distinct filter on it only lets me through zero and one. And my limiter says it comes it comes next to it. It says I just stop at ten, so I get two. 
and I went, I'm waiting for the third one. And my, my, my iterator is still providing me with zero and one and zero and one, and this thing says, nope, I already have them. But the next buddy in line does it. If I limit it at two, you will see. Perfectly. So what you should do is turn these things around. If I would limit them as, say, 10, and I will run them, hey, it finishes now. So, <coughs> we saw this one, right? And this one runs forever without, oh, without useful output. But what do you think about this? It's getting, it's getting cold, so I want a bit of heat. Okay. Okay, I can hear it. You see what the problem is? It now just don't don't over overloads one core. It overloads everything. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Yeah, boss. I need a new MacBook. That's right. <laughs> so we can take two lessons out of this. First of all, make sure that the, the order of your uh, assignments of your of your of your uh, filters in this case, the distinct and limit, are in the correct order. Second of all, don't use parallel just like that. Okay, work parallel. Because if you do this, you do not test it. You put it into production. You only you do you, you do not only overclock one. You overclock every CPU you have. I don't know how, how your boss thinks about that, but. That's kind of area you, I, I, will, I will get fired on, I guess. So, we saw this one, and we saw this one. Oh, saw the mistake. Make sure that the limit and the distinct is in the correct order. This will run forever. So be sure that you um, watch out with parallels, because parallel looks like a magic wand but it uses the fork joint thread pool, which is quite cool, but the pool is not infinite. So that means if you use parallel more and more and more and more times, it actually gets your, prob uh, your, your program slower. Only use parallel for functions or computations that really needs the parallelization. If it doesn't need the parallelization, don't do it. Or you have to tweak something that your fork joint thread pool is degrading. Still, don't do it. Don't use parallel unless absolutely necessary. And you know, just make just measure it if you need it. First of all, don't replace every loop with strings. And if you do, take care that you, that it's useful. So don't say, okay, list dot stream dot for each. Doesn't make sense. Be careful with infinite strings. Only use a stream once because you can only consume it once. It's not data structure. Be careful with parallel. It's not a data structure. And streams do not do anything until you consume it. Java is still awesome. It's an object-oriented language. And it will stay an object-oriented language. It's not a functional language. If you want to do pure functional programming and you want to stick to that, please use something else. You can use functional style of programming. You can, you know, well, sorry, you can use declarative style of programming, which makes your code more readable in most ways. But you have to be careful. Don't be the new kid. Like, I have a new toy, I want to do everything with my new toy. No, we're all smart people. Keep thinking. Use these things with care. So don't be a cowboy, and don't just blindly turn every thing into these new, these new APIs. If you want to know more about these puzzlers, I will publish the slides, of course. Just go to uh, this YouTube video by uh, Baruch and uh, Victor. It's from the VJIC session from last year. There's actually a new session uh, a few months ago with, a new, with new puzzlers, and I just ripped these puzzles from there, and I changed them a bit. So I would give them credit. On the other hand, if you want to do, do uh, know more about optionals, 
go to Stuart Marx, who's one of the guys from Oracle, also known as uh, Dr. Deprecator. He has a marvelous talk about optionals, and uh, because everybody has an opinion on it, I like the title, The Mother of All Bike Shit. <laughs> Please go to that YouTube video as well, it's, it's, it's great material. And uh, that's it for now, thank you. <laughs> I know there were a lot of questions. Are there any questions? Nice, so I can get my beer. Thank you. <laughs> Take a break, go to the bathroom, get some drinks, and then we'll start again in five, ten minutes, okay? <laughs>